went or got a, got across. Thank you, Peter. Uh, to everybody here is what kind of why we're here today, right? Um, and I think the whole community wants to to really build a great library to work with OMEs are um, in Java, right? Or on the JVM. Uh, and those two things are actually quite different and we'll discuss what that means a little bit uh, here today. This presentation was put together by Sebastian and myself on behalf of OME, uh, Scalable Minds, and Glencoe Software. So it is not from everybody in the entire Java community. This is really starting the conversation. Um, and I'm sure we'll have different perspectives uh, here as we as we move along. Uh, I'm going to try and get through things in a reasonable amount of time today. Uh, I expect to not use the whole two hours, but we'll see um, what happens. Uh, a lot of what we're going to go over here today is kind of matter of fact. It's the state of play, and it's a proposal for how to move forward. Um, so we'll just kind of walk through that um, progression and hopefully um, come to some concrete outcomes and some consensus about uh, how we'd like to move forward together. So just briefly, why are we here sort of in more depth? I think as we started to look at this more seriously, and Josh certainly already foreshadowed a lot of the issues here, um, building a great library for OMI and GFF means we need the foundation, um, the czar library, to also be strong. We can't really have a lot of machinations there. We need a solid foundation to build upon. We know that the biomedical imaging community on the JVM, so in particular Java, but also other JVM languages like Kotlin and Scala, is alive and well. There are several developers around in this room who use that programming language and that uh, virtual machine environment as their primary uh, development environment, but also how they distribute what they're doing. And certainly the ImageJ and Fiji communities are um, very strong. Unfortunately, I think mostly because everybody just needed to get stuff done, the JVM czar community is incredibly fragmented. Um, I think across, in particular, the um, libraries for handling uh, object storage, there's no less than 100-something forks of some of these repositories, um, many in various states of kind of disrepair. Um, that fragmentation in the community, which I think Jean Karim was certainly alluding to earlier, it really increases the developer friction. It makes it really difficult for somebody new to come and say, hey, I want to read this czar data. I want to read it from the places where it's stored. Um, and I want to be confident that that's working as expected and that things are going to work well based on what has been said to me in presentations about what I can do with, with czar. So it really affects the adoption there. Um, you got new people, they try to find reference libraries. They don't quite work. They're hard to use. They're poorly documented, poorly tested, et cetera. It's, it, it's, it's not great from, from a developer experience point of view. And really what we are talking about here today is the developer experience, right? Um, many of the foundational libraries, and we'll get to kind of why that's important uh, here in a couple of slides, also lack maintainership direction uh, and that makes it hard for the community to have confidence in what they're going to build upon is going to be supported in 6, 12, 18 months time uh, and going to be solid and going to continue to work, right? I think and feel quite strongly about this, uh, that cross-language participation in the czar ecosystem makes the specification and makes the 
file format and all of this kind of stuff around uh, that at a very foundational level stronger, right? Uh, it's actually not great to have everything be very Python focused. And it is very Python focused now. It makes it harder for to get the adoption that that we want if if everything's focused on one infrastructure um, or one programming language and one kind of ecosystem. One other thing that we wanted to be able to do kind of through this was to kind of get a sense of what we consider the baseline set of czar features. If you go and read the czar Python documentation now and look at all the things that are possible, there's no other library out there that even comes close to doing all of that stuff. It's, you know, probably the best implementations are 10 or 15% of what, of what's there. Um, and that's just not a great position to be. It makes it hard for developers and even users to understand, okay, if I do these types of things with SAR Python and the ecosystem around it, is somebody else actually going to be able to work with this going forward, right? Without having, you know, exactly that version and exactly that um, stack. So it, you know, again, we really need that solid foundation to try and do what we need to do um, in the JVM. And also to try and, you know, keep a lid, so to speak, um, on the Python guys and make sure that, you know, what's getting built into the czar library and the specification is actually implementable um, in other languages, right? Just a quick disclaimer from all of us who've uh, put the presentation together and also who contributed uh, things to it. Uh, I'll put my hand up, put my hand up on behalf of certainly Sebastian and Norman. We are not experts in all the projects I'm about to mention. <laughs> um, and only a fraction of them have been used in a serious way. Uh, across what we're going to go over here, there's probably several million lines of code. We're not experts in every library, and I'm certainly more than happy to be told, hey, no, this does this, or this is planned, um, et cetera, or to be, have be, or to be told. Uh, there are no doubt uh, libraries and projects that are missing from this review um, or that we've not had time to look at. We've been kind of working on this review for about six to eight weeks. Um, now, so there's just a limited number of, of projects that we could, uh, get through and, you know, work over. Um, I think the other thing that's really important to stay, say here is that here in 2022, working on the JVM means more than just coding things up in Java. Uh, in fact, the primary programming language for much of scalable minds work is not Java. <laughs> um, so while Sebastian and I can certainly read a little bit of those languages, it's not our primary programming environment. We are not Scala or Kotlin experts uh, by any stretch of the imagination. Um, and finally, while there are some native code implementations that we're going to look at here, um, our skills are reasonable, but it's also not our primary development environment. Um, and we don't know all of the, the various different uh, pieces that are there, okay? In short, we're trying our best, but boy, we are all more than happy to be told, hey, there's this library, it does everything, it's got great support, et cetera, or someone putting their hand up and saying, hey, you know, we actually are doing this and you just haven't seen it. Um, I don't think any of us is really this is what we want to spend our all of our waking moments uh, building uh, these libraries and and working uh, in this space. Okay. So what we also tried to do was to getting back to this idea of having a sort of foundational or basic set of requirements that the czar ecosystem should as a whole should be attempting to kind of settle on as the base uh, set. It's not the first time that we have been talking about implementations on the JVM. Um, sort of the first mentions that I could 
see about this in the sort of czar repositories goes all the way back to 2018. So this isn't a new conversation. It's not a new question. Um, and looking at this kind of superficially, it seems like a fairly simple problem, right? The JVM ecosystem is big. There's lots of libraries. There's lots of people working in it. Uh, it should be relatively easy to do, right? Um, and hopefully I'll, you know, in going through this, I'll explain why it's not so easy to do um, and why we are partly in the situation we're in. But getting a little more specific, there's kind of a list of, of requirements there on the right-hand side from, and this is again, purely from a developer's perspective about what things that this reference library, to use uh, Jean Karim's language, should do in Java um, and what things it probably should be tested against um, to Josh's point. I'm not gonna go through all the elements uh, that are there in detail, uh, but by and large, they are, Lara, for the most part, uh, relatively well represented with almost all of the packages that um, we're going to mention today that are in the ecosystem now. Um, so just quickly, they should support um, Java 8 or higher. They should work with the czar v2 specification, including uh, the dimension separator. They should largely be inspired by that czar Python API, uh, its foundational concepts, should support all the data types that um, are largely in the specification. And there are some tricky ones in czar, which we can talk about if people are interested. Uh, should support the reason a reasonable set of stores and the important one here, which almost none of the implementations that I'm going to talk about support right now is actually HT, raw HTTP. Most are focused on S3 specifically. And while S3 is HTTP, there's a substantial difference between speaking the S3 API and just speaking raw HTTP uh, to an S3 bucket. And almost all of the implementations that you will have seen over the last few days are not speaking raw S3. They are speaking HTTP to public buckets. Um, should have an extensible compression uh, scheme. Uh, BLOSC is still the default for in czar Python, um, but there's a whole w wide range of uh, loss less compression schemes that are supported there, uh, et cetera. Critically, there should be a chunk API, so allowing you to just retrieve the chunks, uh, and a basic slicing API. This is kind of the, the very simple things that you would be able to do with NumPy on, on top of Czar Python. Something that's really important to Norman's uh, group, but also uh, important, I think, for Glencoe Software going forward is we need asynchronous API options. Um, many of us are building servers on top of these libraries. And we have asynchronous in infrastructure that we'd like to sit on top. Uh, so it, ne it really needs to be able to do, to do those things or at least expose primitives that allow us to do that. And we know that there's work on sharding. We know that the V3 specification for czar is coming soon. The infrastructure needs to be able to support that evolution, um, both from a technical perspective, but also from a governance and um, engagement perspective. So we're not just looking at the technical merits of these projects. We're also looking at how they conduct themselves and you know how easy it is to, to get modifications and changes included. Okay. Um, so why isn't this all done? Why are, why are we even here talking about this? Should be easy, right? Java ecosystem's got tons of stuff in it. So just looking at what happens in Czar Python now, if you're just installing czar, these are the packages that you will see, right? You go in, you go into Python, you do pip install czar, you're ready to work, right? And that means you're ready to work on the, critically, you're ready to work on the file system and the file system only, right? But you've got num codecs there, which means you have all the compressors. In fact, way more compressors and decompressors than the list I mentioned um, and the baseline set of requirements. Um, and you have about, I don't know what the latest is, about 1.7 million lines of code, including vectorization and all sorts of stuff uh, there in NumPy, right? Um, so you have an, you know, just with the libraries that you see, 
on this list by just doing pip install czar, you have an incredible amount of developer power. You know, not even considering the amount of money that's currently going into supporting these projects. It's substantial, right? Um, and, you know, the developer ecosystems around them. I didn't go in and, you know, count up all the stars on GitHub for the various projects here, but it's immense, right? Um, the community engagement in these projects is, is incredible, right? Uh, and that's not something that the Python community should have to apologize for. Uh, it's just when we're looking at this in the Java community, we have to be realistic, right, about the amount of, of interest that there is in some of these core libraries and their maintainership, right? Now, if we expand what we just talked about and we say, hey, we also want to support S3 and just S3, so we're not talking about Google Cloud Storage and Azure and all this kind of stuff. We just want to add S3. The library account goes to about 30 here, right? In order to support that. Um, critically, there's FS spec here. There's all of S3FS. There's all of the AWS uh, SDK included here. Uh, there's a whole bunch of asynchronous uh, I.O. libraries that work with the HTTP stack, et cetera, et cetera. Um, if we looked at the previous group and then looked at this, right, in terms of the um, engagement in a lot of these projects, it's just as immense. It's just as significant, right? Um, and again, it's not something that this uh, community should have to apologize for, but looking at this in the Java context, Right, there aren't even core libraries for many of these things that are even that even exist in the Java ecosystem right now in any sort of significant level. Right, um, you know, just looking at those two ecosystems side by side, it's it is not even in the same league, right, uh, in terms of open source libraries that that do these things and and have an incredible amount of community backing. Right. Um, so unfortunately, we're already kind of, you know, two or three steps behind before we even start, right? Now, with that said, it's not like we haven't tried to work on this problem and talk about it in the community, and it's not like people haven't worked on it. They have. And this is kind of a little bit of a history here of what's happened sort of since early uh, 2017. A lot of the sort of original work in this space, so the Java next generation file format um, area, was actually started um, with the Genialia crew with N5. And those you know, two communities have kind of converged um, on a few things. There's still differences, but there is a lot of historical code there and effort to to try and build libraries to to work with these things in the in the java ecosystem as we move a little bit further we've got some native uh implementations z5 in particular but it's not until early 2018 when we start talking about really cross language implementations of czar in the public repositories i'm sure people were talking about it privately hey how you know this czar thing looks kind of cool let's let's try and use it from java or let's try and use it from c++ um and actually that first question wasn't even about the jvm it was about matlab in particular um so you know the these questions have been batting been batted around for a little while um there was actually initially quite a Quite an effort uh, on that JVM czar implementation issue on the czar uh, community repository around you know getting an implementation going, et cetera. Um, and that NDRA Scala uh, repository is really kind of the first, as far as I could tell, you know, focused effort in the JVM to getting things going on in terms of reading this type of data, but also providing more of the infrastructure to be able to work with multi-dimensional arrays. Um, the JZAR project uh, starts then in sort of early 2019, followed by uh, the Solfeld Lab group and their N5 ZAR backend. And we'll discuss a little bit about, you know, 
why that's potentially problematic in terms of getting a whole ton of things uh, built there with Czar being a backend for N5 rather than being kind of a first-class citizen there. Um, a lot of our basic uh, decision-making and discussion here uh, came through our Glencoe software efforts on bioformats to raw. That's a well-publicized um, public sort of history. You can read about it on the OMI and GFF repository about how we kind of got to where we were. Czar was not our initial focus there. We worked on a whole bunch of other things, including uh, the initial versions of, of bioformats to raw being you know N5 focused. We, we only worked with N5. We didn't even work with Czar in those early days. So um, we're kind of using bioformats to raw as the center point for you know these libraries and, and our exposure to them. More recently, the UCAR group uh, has tried to get czar support into NetCDF. Um, that first started in C, and there were a bunch of extensions also added there, which, you know, if you're interested in that, Josh can talk about probably some of the things that the uh, the NetCDF guys added to support other things that they wanted to do. Um, and, you know, we can discuss a little bit about, you know, what that means for potentially using that library at all. Um, but most recently, the same group released NetCDF uh, inside of NetCDF Java, support for Czar. Um, and critically, that unlike a lot of other things that that library does, it actually doesn't leverage uh, the NetCDF C implementation. It's a kind of clean room uh, Java implementation by itself. So this is kind of how we got to where we are today, the various projects. There's other things involved here. I didn't add, you know, when we published the OMI and GFF specifications here and the various different versions, um, as well as all the different uh, czar releases as well, uh, the czar Python releases, that is. Um, those things could probably go on this timeline, but uh, they did get pretty messy pretty quickly. So there's obviously a lot of work from a lot of groups um, largely scratching their own itch, work doing their own things to do their own science or satisfy their own users. Um, and that's kind of led us to where we are today, at least with OME, Glencoe Software, uh, what the Scalable Minds group has done and kind of the the most quote unquote thorough uh, Java implementation that has good support, reasonable documentation, um, and a fairly cohesive and focused uh, or czar focused uh, implementation. That is JZAR, JBLOSK with um, the Laserson Lab fork of the wrapper, and then the CBLOSK uh, native code, and a JSR203 uh, NIO2 implementation of some description. Uh, we are using that Laserson Lab uh, fork I mentioned earlier. There are about a hundred and some odd forks with various bug fixing and changes to API, et cetera. And I think Norman's group even has their own um, fork of this in their own repositories. Um, most of these uh, repos have gone through a, a cycle of lots of excitement, fixing a bunch of things, work, hey, the library does what we needed to do, and then essentially atrophy uh, after not a lot of development, uh, not a lot of focus, certainly not addressing security concerns or updating the AWS SDK or any of that kind of stuff. Um, you know, I think actually the the versions uh, that are in that are linked in that library uh, go back to kind of 2017 actually, uh, which is problematic for for a bunch of reasons. So this is kind of where we are now. It's what most of the people are using. Um, some folks are definitely using that N5 style uh, implementation, but at least for the people who you know are here today, this is largely um, where we are, and it does most of the things um, that we want to do in that requirements list. 
as far as kind of the what happens, what doesn't happen, what kind of works, um, you'll see this pattern repeated now as we kind of go through the other options that are in this space uh, for addressing that real core, um, hey, we want a great library that is a reference library that people can build on uh, and have confidence in. Um, JSR ticks a large number of these boxes. I'm not going to go over the green ones, but just sp quickly mention the partially or not supported at all uh, options. Because JSR relies on file system implementations to deal with alternative storage, i.e. not file system, uh, it really does require those secondary community components, just like Czar Python does, right? Czar Python does not support these libraries natively for the most part. It relies on FSSpec and other implementations and other community projects in order to deliver support for alternative storage. Um, and that's the same thing here with JSR. And there aren't great implementations right now of that JSR 203 API in particular for HTTP. Um, the AWS S3 one is kind of ropey, uh, not very well supported, certainly doesn't tick the boxes uh, that I mentioned on the first uh, few slides there about having an a API that is solid, dependable um, with, a, with community backing. JSR definitely does not have an extensible compression infrastructure. It has good support for the compression and decompression of most of the um, compression codecs that these are Python library supports out of the box, uh, but you can't add your own compressors. Most of the factory that supports all of this stuff is, is largely closed. So it's, it's very difficult to add um, additional ones. Critically, it does allow slicing, so you can ask for arbitrary blocks of data, and it will give them to you. Um, so, you know, ticks that box nicely. But it doesn't have, unfortunately for in particular Norman's group at the moment, it doesn't have any asynchronous uh, API at all. Everything is synchronous. Uh, there are no futures. There is no even no infrastructure to support um, working uh, asynchronously here, even on network storage. And there's really no community interest, uh, as Josh was implying earlier, in supporting sharding work or, you know, even uh, supporting changes, supporting the uh, PRs from the community to uh, add czar v3 specification support, et cetera. So um, unfortunately, we're in this case where we have actually pretty good technical support, but actually not great community governance and uh, ability to for the for the community at, at large to to make contributions here. Um, list of uh, details about the library. I don't think these are particularly important at this this juncture, but um, gives you a sense of of where things are. I uh, I will say probably for just for. The benefit of everybody that we definitely want this library and work that we do here to be totally permissively licensed, just like Czar Python is. Uh, I did not say that emphatically earlier on, but probably goes uh, goes without saying at this point. Um, so with JZAR plus all of the elements, I mentioned uh, some of these criteria earlier and all the things that, that need to happen in order for JSR plus these other community projects to support uh, the use of Zar in that JVM ecosystem. These are all the things that need, that need to be, uh, need to happen. And in, you'll notice there actually that the JSR um, library actually uses the multi-dimensional array implementations that are in uh, NetCDF and their common data model in order to, to do some work. So it's not like there isn't kind of cross-pollination across these uh, projects already. It's just quite fractured, right? Um, all of us who have been working with these libraries for a, net for a while know the limitations, but uh, if you just work with these things out of the box, for example, 
Uh, you cannot use the AWS S3 APIs and critically the S3 API, not raw HTTP uh, for anonymous access because of the internals of the stack and what it expects to be present. Um, something that's very close to our hearts since we're trying to deploy this type of infrastructure in a lot of biotech and pharma where we have security reviews, we have to justify uh, literally every set of AWS uh, AMI or IAM, excuse me, um, permissions that we add, there's an excessive amount that we require in order to actually get these things to function. Uh, because of all that, and uh, in particular, the requirements right now for these libraries to access ACLs, uh, which are basically imp implemented by nobody uh, other than AWS themselves with respect to um, building S3 compatible implementations, um, the libraries, et cetera, do not play particularly nicely with S3 compatible storage. So if you have object storage, for example, uh, you've bought a product from Dell or you're using Ceph to um, expose the S3 API, uh, it's really tricky to, to work with this stuff now. Um, there's really limited library maintenance. I've, I've said this a few times now. Uh, and you know, certainly limited commitment to new features. Everyone's kind of focused on scratching their own itch, dealing with their own problem, um, and you know, not uh, really supporting uh, additional efforts. And everything is is largely synchronous. So that's kind of where we are now with the libraries that we're using, with the restrictions that we have. Um, what about some other options? What about the other things that I mentioned in sort of that timeline? And how come we aren't using those? And you know, where does that all go? So let's just um, kind of go through them, I guess, in chronological order, so to speak. Um, out of the Solfeld lab, we have all of the N5 infrastructure, including N5 and ZAR itself. These libraries are actually pretty fully featured, largely do a substantial amount of the things that we would like them to do. Still don't have an asynchronous API, really. Um, and it's not clear exactly how we would get sharding support into this and how we would get N5 ZAR to potentially work with the uh, V3 specification. But probably the most tricky thing about these particular libraries is if you want to do any slicing at all, you must really use ImageLib2 or you must do your own sort of chunk um, aggregation or uh, cutting out, so to speak. Um, really, N5 APIs are chunk only. They allow you to write chunks and read chunks, but that's all they do, right? So if you want adjacent chunks as a single array or whatever, that's your responsibility, right? The, the core API does not uh, really focus on that. Um, and because of the nature of N5 being focused on its own API, the ZAR implementation is really a backend, right? Um, it's not a first class citizen there, which makes the composition of the N5 API, the ZAR APIs and the ZAR structure and object storage or alter other alternative storage techniques really quite tricky. And we've been trying to work on this for at least two years now. I think Josh's original PRs actually are sort of early, early October, 2020. Um, and it's really hard to reconcile those changes because that you would have to change actually quite a bit of the infrastructure to allow pluggable storage um, infrastructure there to, to do it. Um, so there's, it's, there's a lot of like technical pluses here, but it's actually quite difficult to you know, wrangle the libraries to do all the things that we want to do. Um, so moving on, Z5. Um, Constantine Pape and his um, colleagues working here. This is a native implementation uh, in C++. So, you know, supporting it would require us writing and maintaining a JNI interface, which I don't think any of the group is particularly against, but we got to have a really good C++ implementation that does a lot of what we want uh, to even consider this. It's a lot of effort 
um, both from the point of view of the developer, um, from the developer point of view, but also from the library maintenance uh, and community engagement point of view to to ship a native library and and then have wrappers on top. So it's also not a great fit. Um, I think one thing that we talked about a reasonable amount with the crew is that the C++ developer pool in the biomedical uh, sciences is actually quite small. The people who would actually work on, on such a thing. Um, and that makes it doubly difficult. Um, but, you know, lar largely uh, reasonable support here and a reasonably uh, focused and um, diligent developer group uh, pushing the library forward. So again, not a great fit. Uh, moving on to the NDRA uh, Scala implementation, as I'm sure Norman can talk about this much better than I can, going from Java to Scala is actually doable. Going from Scala to Java is really tricky. Um, you can do it, but boy, you got to think about it really, um, really hard. So it makes it difficult for us to support other JVM languages um, if we, you know, focused on on this library. Um, there hasn't been a lot of development. In fact, none since about February 2019. So there's no support for the dimension separators. There's, you know, limited czar uh, evolution implemented here. Um, there's really limited support for additional storage. In fact, it's not even clear that any of the additional, any of the storage backends that are in this library now beyond the file system actually work. <laughs> um, I didn't have a chance to test them in any sort of uh, significant level. And if we think that the C++ developer community is small uh, right now in the biomedical sciences, uh, the Scala community is a fraction of that even. Um, so makes it difficult from a sort of community perspective to kind of put our weight behind this. Um, but it's certainly an option. Um, and then just finally, we have this, you know, recent uh, NetCDF Java implementation, which again, kind of ticks a lot of boxes, but um, Zar is not the core focus of the development here. Actually, if you look at the NetCDF repositories and try and get a sense of what we, what we would need to include, it's a huge amount of infrastructure to bring in. Um, not to say maybe that's not a good idea, but we still have things that aren't supported here. Uh, there's a limited set of the stores that are actually, that are actually work and supported. Uh, there's no asynchronous API. There's no sense of what potentially might happen with sharding or, or supporting the V3 specification. Um, it's quite new and it's not clear, uh, that there will be additional core development, um, on this going forward. It's definitely, you know, not the focus of, of the library. Um, so ticking a lot of boxes technically, but again, tricky from a community perspective for us to kind of throw throw weight um, behind it and get things, um, get contributions in and, you know, push the library forward. And also tricky to, to bring all those de dependencies into every um, Java um, stack that, that we have. So as far as options, that's that's the the last one that I'm going to you know kind of go over in in any sort of um, deep detail. Uh, Josh mentioned while we were kind of putting this together, hey, it'd be nice to have um, a kind of high level overview of all these. Uh, I said, yes, that'd be nice, but I don't have time to do it. And of course, um, Josh just said, well, I'll do it. Uh, so we have. Um, a relatively nice high level overview here of the various implementations, what they do, uh, what they support well and what they kind of don't support that well. Um, and you know, some of the, the community, um, elements, um, fair to say, as I mentioned, kind of, as we started, there's actually pretty good support for all of these, from all these libraries across most of the things that we'd like a basic implementation to do. 
but none of them do the critically, none of them do them all. <laughs> um, and there's again, this kind of um, support in one area, but not support in another. And some are trying to do everything in their own library. Some are trying to bring in other community uh, tools uh, to do that. So it makes it tricky for us to kind of work together and certainly very tricky to have a true reference implementation that the czar developer group and the steering council could get behind. It's really hard to do that uh, when it's not the primary goal of, of the project, right? So where we got to was this kind of um, basic proposal of, of a path to take forward. Um, and critically, that path is to take a page out of the czar Python book a little bit and allow people who are focused on particular components of the ecosystem to focus on what they're good at, right? Nobody in the whole group here uh, of all the implementations I just mentioned, for example, implements their own Blosk um, compressor and decompressor. Everyone's either using the C implementation directly in the case of the native code or using the wrappers, right? But the JBlosk repositories are essentially dead. They've had no uh, maintenance, and we need to deal with that problem, right? We need to take responsibility really for it. Um, and even as, as great work as Ryan Williams has done to kind of make this a little bit easier, it's still not great, right? Um, so getting along this idea of trying to bring a bunch of community projects that deliver on the set of requirements that we set out together and make sure that we have a good place for them uh, to work. Um, the same is true for that uh, JSR203 implementation. Uh, so trying to bring those under Zar, the Zar developers banner um, on GitHub and so that they're easy to find. Everybody knows what the the, in, the reference implementations are, that they have good support, they have consistent testing, uh, that people are upgrading the dependencies, uh, et cetera. I mean, the JBlosk uh, stack there now isn't even running any testing on uh, new Blosk uh, C uh, library changes. So who knows when that's going to break? I'm sure it will at some point. Um, and it won't be us developers who find this out. It'll be some user somewhere, right? And we'll be trying to react to it. So it's tricky. Um, Glencoe Software has a commitment to making sure that there are object code, you know, pre-built object code um, repositories uh, for these uh, native code blobs to live and that they're available for a wide cross-section of architectures. Um, Obviously, we want this stuff to work on Mac OS. We want thing, this stuff to work on Windows. We need it to work on Linux for sure. Um, so trying to bring those things under the banners. And then finally, start a new Zar Java repository where we try to bring all the lessons learned from the existing Java libraries and potentially even from the, the Scala ones um, together under one uh, banner with one direction, with one um, concrete focus on on having that great uh, czar Java implementation. Um, and try our best to, you know, take all of those those components in and and you know deliver on each each level since we we kind of need this. And if we don't do it, what's going to happen is we're just going to have an increasing amount of, of fractured implementations. Glencoe Software and OME will have our own forks. Uh, Norman and his group at Scalable Minds will have their own, probably some tweaked with additional uh, Scala infrastructure that pretty much nobody else will be able to use apart from them. Um, you know, we won't be in a, in a great place. So that's what we'd like to do, um, or at least what we'd like to try to do. Um, I don't think there's any reason not to try to do this, try to bring everybody together, try to foster some community focus on the components that uh, the community cares about. Hopefully this will also foster an environment where people who care about 
other alternative storage. And for example, for us, Azure is a big um, component. Uh, allow to provide a, a place where people can work on, on those individual uh, implementations without trying to support them across six, seven, eight different forks, et cetera, uh, and try to integrate them there. So that's where I will close. Um, this is what we you know, like, like to try. I think we have good support from the community and from the Zara Steering Council to, to try this out and to try and get you know, momentum behind a, a reference implementation. Um, but I'll let you all digest a little bit about what I just said. I'll pass the floor over to Norman. Um, let him say anything else he'd, he'd like to say um, beyond what I've already outlined here. Um, and then we'll take any questions and comments. I have not been reading the hat chat. I will try and do that here while I pass things over to Norman. So the floor is yours, sir. Yeah, thank you very much. I don't think though I have much to add. I, I think your presentation was very comprehensive and um, uh, and obviously we already synced uh, to, to make sure that the content matches our, our ideas. Um, but I would propose to take a five minute break um, before we go into, into the questions and uh, discussion. So maybe it also helps to digest the, everything you just said a bit. Okay, so Definitely. let's, Definitely. Yeah, let's, maybe, Thanks, let's reconvene five after the hour or something like that. Very good. Thanks, guys. See you in Thank you. at five past the hour. Thank you, Director Peter. Right on. All right. I was just going to quickly address this uh, or maybe start uh, the conversation off here with the a couple of the comments and questions that were in the chat there. Um, firstly, from the point of view of um, Stefan, yeah, it's a big it's a big ask. Um, to to do everything that Sar Python does, um, and I think one of certainly my personal um, interests in even doing this presentation and starting to talk about it is to try and bring that you know, and sometimes the comments I make on Czar Python and community issues is to try and focus the czar python community um bring them back a little bit to thinking about uh language ecosystems outside of python uh there's just so much um momentum there uh and so much great work going on everybody wants to use all the stuff uh and that's that's great uh but if we want other people in other programming languages as an and and environments to be able to work with this data we have to think about them too we can't just uh, think about that um, Python ecosystem um anything else you want to say on it uh Stefan yeah um yeah thank you for the for the presentation I think this is this was uh, very helpful for me um so to to get a, a very condensed overview of, uh, of, of of what the Java uh, community has, um, is facing with um, currently. So um, and yes, uh, so I, 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 yeah, I understand. Uh, probably there's 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 so much dynamic in the Python uh, world. Um, it's I don't know um, uh, how actually dynamic it is, but it seems a little bit maybe chaotic. Things are, uh, people are trying out a lot of things, and uh, there needs probably some some settlement uh, um, until kind of uh, things are really have a little bit less uh, motion. And for us, kind of from the vendor perspective, um, we need to figure out kind of in which use cases uh, uh, we uh, might need uh, um, kind of to, to be able to uh, write, read, um, access, 
Formazar files, right? And uh, what actually kind of um, uh, comes with kind of certain scenarios, I would say. Uh, for for us, uh, uh, one thing that kind of jumps jumps right right out is yeah, probably we, we need to be able to write to an Omazar file directly, maybe right, um, uh, maybe locally, uh, and then move it around. But uh, what kind of um, uh, push uh, priority would it be for us? So this is something we need to figure out um, to uh, store this directly to an S3 bucket, or something like this, right? So. Um, and that's that's something I also we need to um, get get a better grip um, grip on and and the implications that um, that uh, this has also from the technology step. Definitely, definitely. Jean Karim. Yeah, on the, on the topic of S three, I actually also. Um, I, what I would like to to also have is good support for um, access, native access uh, um, behind all these uh, security requirements that you mentioned, uh, without, for example, to go via S3FS or something like this. At the moment, this is kind of the only possibility because a, a directory like a, a, a czar is is not a, a, an object for for s3 storage an object is a file so how do we actually and and uh, basically all the um typical access like temporary um tokens and stuff like this are only valid for objects so that would mean some file inside the czar directory so I, I don't know exactly how that could work, but basically, how would we be able to access any kind of czar um, uh, directory behind some sort of uh, temporary uh, access or login uh, when it's not actually an object? Yeah, no, this is something that actually it probably goes beyond this conversation a little bit, but um, and certainly, you know, the focus of what we want to do here. But yeah, it's a it's a big issue. Um, I think the other thing that I've been trying to again going back to this kind of trying to bring the Python guys uh back a little bit is that if you decide as you say, Jean Grimm, to be working with signed URLs via uh, to, to access S3, which critically is not using the S3 API, but using H raw HTTP and having those signed URLs to get access to objects, um, you can't do directory listings. <laughs> um, you cannot list objects, for example. And I've been trying quite hard uh, certainly in the, you know, the Java community to try to get everybody to stop looking at what's on the file system, right. And to stop, to use the metadata that's there. And if there's metadata that's missing, okay, we need to add it. But the idea that we're going to be able to work in this ecosystem by listing objects in directories will not work. <laughs> right. Yeah. So um, would it be... But maybe that's a modification of the czar specification, but to have an index file or some sort of manifest or something that actually for the for the cloud use would be what you might want. It's certainly something that I think the whole community needs to think about a little bit, um, for sure. Shankarim, I mean Norman can talk about it a little bit. Um as far as what you know their group is trying to do um as well but yeah um we know this from trying to work with high content screening uh, um you know having actually you know when you're originally designing it having metadata at every level makes sense but boy is that a pain when you move to s3 and you have to make several thousand metadata requests uh over http in order to <laughs> to get that stuff going uh it's a real struggle right 
So I think even um, David Sterling and some of his work with Cell Profiler was suggesting that people do, you know, make consolidated metadata um, calls uh, in order to to do some of this stuff. So yeah, um, there are just some things that the whole community has to wrestle with. Those problems are not unique to the Java sphere. They're the same problem in, in Python um, and certainly the same problem in, in the JavaScript ecosystem. So um, yeah, I think we just need to continue to talk about these things publicly and try and get everybody uh, to understand what those limitations are. Um, and probably, you know, we haven't done the best job of doing that so far, and we have to do a better job of doing it. And when I say we, I mean, uh, Glencoe Software in particular, um, just, you know, using the interactions that we have with the biotech and pharma community and the sort of uh, cloud community there. Uh, who are not interested in public data, oh, by the way, um, you know, have very locked down systems with very specific permission uh, structures. Uh, so we, we probably need to do a better job of just making the community aware of what those constraints are and, and all the things that we need to think about. Um, yeah. No, no, I understand it's not necessarily a, a particular language problem, but I'm just thinking as part of a discussion about implementation. This is uh, at least to me, an important feature, and and so maybe the solution for for implementing that feature is to go back to the specification and say maybe we need to have this manifest index, whatever, something that allows uh, to do it, regardless of the implementation. In general, big thumbs up for if you have a problem going back to the specification. That's a very good thing to do. Let's do more of that. Yes. Oh, but we can just solve it at the Python layer, Josh, and it'll be all fine. You don't want me to get started on dimension separator. Just <laughs> <laughs> don't yep. taunt. Exactly. Um, so yes, there are problems there. There, you know, said it in the intro, right? Um, the lessons learned that we have here that should go back to the specification and those conversations that should happen at the specification level should happen at the specification level. Absolutely. We should not be papering over these issues uh, with language specific implementations. Just before we go on to compression, anything else you want to add, Norman? I think everything has been said, but I just wanted to, to add, I mean, there's multiple level of specifications. Um, so even if like there's we're not going to get like the czar spec to to list all of the available arrays and in, in groups. Um, that's still something that could be defined on the OMI and GFF level. And to some extent, it already is with the multi scales and paths attributes. So that is kind of listable without uh, needing to go through the um, to, to list any directories, which I just want to <laughs> second that that is very, very much a pain and has just been a pain. Um, I mean, on S3, there is at least a list directory command that you can run, but on HTTP, it's just, it's just a hack. Yep. It's a non-starter basically. Yep. Exactly. Yep. yep. Definitely. Just on this related topic before we go to compression specifically, um, and what Ken was raising about, you know, sort of reference implementations and and support for for S three. I would say across the community at the moment, just by the nature of the kind of weight behind uh, AWS and the number of people who are working there. It's the best supported alternative storage at the moment um, across the community. And that includes dealing with security, uh, different ways of providing access keys to um, the storage and probably mm -hmm. is a, you know, a testament to a certain extent of the work that the that Amazon has done in putting into the AWS SDK in Java. It, it is very, very good. That's true on the Python side as well. There's there's a very, very good um, base library there for, for us to work off of. So I would say it's the best um, supported currently. 
doesn't mean that there aren't some wrinkles. <laughs> um, and there are, um, you know, but that's kind of the best, the best we, that we have at the moment. It's the closest we have to saying, Hey, this is officially supported, so to speak. Okay. And uh, just to add that um, S3 basically is an API and although the specification comes from Amazon, many other um, providers of object storage try to implement it. And, and uh, some go even as far as saying that is compatible, fully compatible with uh, the Amazon specification. So um, at the moment, I don't think there is any other API for object storage that goes as far and as is as widely used and supported. Definitely, definitely true. Um, Jack Reim, um, definitely true. And as we were discussing on the czar repositories in particular about locking um, additional uh, object storage capabilities, et cetera, it's actually problematic at the same time because it's kind of the lingua franca of dealing with object storage. Um, it's also incredibly limiting. You can't use the additional <laughs> capabilities of Azure or GCS, et cetera. Um, and there are actually some really exciting features that I think you know much of this community would love to be able to use. I think Norman in particular with a lot of the things that are really important for the electron microscopy, smaller chunk, uh, parallel access uh, infrastructure. There are some unbelievably great capabilities in Azure object storage that would be that would fit really nicely into there. But you can't add those things to a base library if we're also trying to support S3, uh, which is kind of unfortunate. Um, but you know, we'll try to do try to do the best we can. Um, All right. And yes, Ken, it's just as problematic. It's actually worse, I think, in the native code space. Um, and if you want to hear about the difficulties of trying to bring the AWS, Azure, and GCS SDKs mm -hmm. that are in C++ <laughs> all into the same libraries space, yeah, it's... It's a big problem. It's actually easy to talk about the czar fundamentals. It's harder to talk about the other projects uh, that are required in order to kind of deliver on all the features. But in the C, C++ space, there's probably less of this fragmentation that we're trying to deal with with the Java libraries. And I don't know where that's coming from. And in Java, it's just like Chris said, there are literally hundreds of people who have forked and no one's maintaining it. And I think in the C, C++ case, it's more... There's like one person working on one library and that's what you get and you have to use it, right? So it's it's the reverse problem, but it's very, very tricky stuff. Definitely. But I, I would say also, I, I mean, from my very distant perspective, that the tooling in C, C++ is a bit more extensive than in Java, probably. When I don't you know. say the tooling, like the, the all the kind of dependencies that you were listing at the at the beginning, for example, in the the case of Python, the so reliance on on various other libraries. So those functionalities, probably some of them don't exist in the Java ecosystem and may already exist in C C plus plus. It's that's kind of yeah. That's... So basically less. Um, re recoding uh, in C and C++ than in Java, probably. True. I think the, the big difference there, and hopefully I won't hurt anybody's feelings by saying this, but it requires a different class of developer from a focus point of view in order to work in that space. It's It, it just requires different attention, right? Um, and it's probably fair to say up until the last few years, the dependency management and structure in the C++ community was just as fractured as we're talking about with respect to the, you know, amount of forks of the stuff in, in the Java sphere. 
Mm -hmm. right? Um, in fact, you know, at the moment, I would challenge someone to go in and attempt to use TensorStore as a library in their application. <laughs> um, it's actually not an easy job, right? Um, and it requires a lot of work in order to, to do that stuff. That side, I think, is much more mature, right, in the Java and or Python sphere. Uh, but you're right, uh, Jean Karim, there are low level libraries that do a lot of this, and those are what are wrapped often in the Python sphere, right? Because it's easier to, to do that integration there with native code. Um, in the list of libraries that I put there when, you know, when you do pip install, Probably the amount of C and C++ and even Fortran code that's there in that list uh, is actually greater than the number of lines of Python uh, mm -hmm. that are there in order to support what's that, what, yeah. what is there, right? Like mm -hmm. none of this asynchronous IO stack works without low level C libraries doing this stuff, uh, et cetera, et cetera, right? So, so yeah, uh, it's there, but boy, does it require a completely different, um, type of developer in order to to be able to harness them yeah no i'm just I, i'm a, i'm aware those are really different ways of doing things but um kind of maybe i what i was trying to get at is what maybe is the most efficient path forward in if this involves sticking to if sticking to java involves rewriting some of this low level stuff that is already available um in in c or c plus plus yeah, most of it's there, Jean Karim. Yeah. Um, most of it's there. I think that's proven by if you know if you look at even the Z5 repository, you look at the TensorStore um, repository. You know, there's a lot of good work at um, at the native level to get these things going. Mm -hmm. I will say though that even if you just look at those two implementations, and we want to talk about you know forks and different ways of looking at it, in order for Z5 to support anything, it's using X Tensor. <laughs> Mm -hmm. That is not what TensorStore is using. So even if you had those two libraries, just those two structures, you would not be able to work between them without, you know, mm -hmm. copying memory and doing all sorts of things in order to do that. So, yeah, you know, going back to what Stefan was saying earlier about the Python community, the Python community is really lucky, right? Basically, the might behind NumPy makes a lot of these things possible. I think it's probably true that Czar would not exist as it exists today without the NumPy ecosystem. Um, so it, it has a kind of everybody in the community, everybody in the data science community, everybody in the scientific um, processing, data processing community knows what NumPy is and can work with those APIs, right? And has things mm -hmm. that work on top of it. Uh, that's definitely not true uh, for C++ uh, and certainly not true for Java. Josh, anything else you want to add before you, you're just talking about um, things with uh, TensorStore, et cetera? Um, not really. So. Um, I guess mostly I haven't gotten my hands dirty. So that that's a general problem with the number of implementations we have is none of us are able to to accurately test all of them. So that mm -hmm. is a great thing for people in the community to help with. Um, we have a couple of repositories where it would be nice to have them regularly tested. That would be a super nice to have. But even just feedback on, yes, this is installable or um, yeah, the performance is what we expect or it's not what we expect. And Either obviously everyone who's doing that testing is welcome to feed that back to the original authors, or we can do that. You know, so it can the feedback can come to us, and we will, mm, I guess, uh, anonymize that as a, as needed, <laughs> and and send it back. I think there's a lot of so I could probably myself go through for each of the implementations and give you a feeling for how dedicated they are to really moving forward. Um, I do think uh, Tensor Store will continue to be a, a an improving implementation. Um, I don't know, you know, as Chris says, I don't know what it looks like to use it as an as a um, as a library, but I know it's being quite heavily used by Neuroglancer. So they're depending on it. So it will be invested in. Um, an implementation that I have very little uh, insight into, but I know they're also quite invested is GDAL. So in the geospatial uh, 
um, community, they re-implemented their own czar. And I, I'm not sure if it's C or C++ because they needed it internally. But it may then get into situations where they're doing something that's custom to geospatial as opposed to just implementing the czar spec, you know, this kind of common problem. Um, the extensor implementation, so I'm just kind of going through the, the, the native versions that I know of. Um, I haven't seen a lot of movement that may change, but at the moment it's it's less uh, well developed. Uh, however, Constantine did express interest in possibly dropping his own C++ implementation in Z5 and just reusing extensors are internally. So that would be, so wherever we can, we want to take two implementations, that's what this whole conversation is about, and get them back together, right? And so extensor and czar and Z5 might do that. That would be a win. I don't know where that leaves X, uh, sorry, tensor store and GDAL, but I would like to get them all back. There has been some very initial um, discussion around extracting NetCDFC's C implementation into something like libzar. And that's probably the best potential for a common C library across the board. Uh, the Unidata group has said they've done that previously. And uh, I can't remember which library they talked about doing that with. But there was some originally net CDFC code that got extracted out into a libc library. Um, and they could see doing that again. That's probably a little bit down the road. They don't have a ton of capacity to do things like that. But if there's help, there is a way, I think, to with the current NetCDFC build system to turn off all the extras and you would have just the NCSR library. So if someone wants to experiment with that, by all means. And then, as I said in the chat earlier, the NetCDF Java implementation would also be interested in kind of looking at this czar Java library as something they could build on. So we hopefully we can work towards a nice layering of these libraries so that everyone's not re-implementing things from the top to the bottom. Over. Yeah, big uh, big crossed fingers. Fingers crossed, Josh. Yeah. I think probably one other thing to say about TensorStore is that probably the, the number of users of TensorStore from Python is far greater than the number of users of TensorStore from C++ directly. <laughs> um, so, yeah. I mean, it is what it is. Um, just to circle back a little bit on the compression discussion that was briefly in the chat from earlier and lossy compression in, in particular, at least for us, um, Bunco Software, one of our primary domains in which we do a lot of work right now is whole slide imaging. And boy, we need lossy compression there in order to function at all. If we don't have it, doesn't matter how good the file format specification is or how good the metadata specification is, that community will not use any of this stuff unless we have lossy compression and really good lossy compression. Um, at the, they would really like to have um, lossless conversion in, in fact, from the proprietary file formats and those compression schemes into whatever we do. Uh, we have some funding uh, to work on that. We're going to try and work on some of that with bioformats to try and give low-level APIs to get access to the compressed blocks uh, with JPEG and JPEG 2000. That's actually not a too difficult problem to take the compressed data and then try and get it into chunks. Um, but there's some pretty critical things that have to happen uh, in order for that to work. So yes, lossy compression is a big thing. I know that's, you know, at the moment, that's not what almost any of this community talks about. Um, pretty much everybody talks purely about lossless compression um, and raw chunks uh, and accepts the fact that Rechunking is a thing and that you can just do it whenever you want and you won't lose any data. Uh, that is definitely not true for the whole slide imaging community. And that will be something going back to what we're talking about specification. Um, we're going to have to wrestle with because, you know, that was definitely not a consideration when this stuff was originally started. For sure. I can pick on Norman a little bit. I mean, 
Yeah, Norman, you guys started with just one channel, right? <laughs> I mean, and that's true, but we have a story be before Zar, and then we also have JPEG <laughs> compression, and New York Lancer also use that for their the large uh, EM data sets that they host. So it's uh, lossy compression is certainly something that's also in our interest. Um, I think it's it's but it's not on the on the top a priority list just yet. I think getting the, the interface for these compressors is very important. Once we have that, it's, it's much easier to add more compressors like JPEG or, or others. So I think, I mean, we have we have different problems at the moment actually that we need to solve first and then uh, other compressions will be will be a much easier problem to solve later on. But you're, you're talking about compression essentially from the visualization point of view, not for the uh, processing or analysis point of view. All data in slide yeah. imaging is compressed in the proprietary file formats before. It's always compressed, always, always, always. Yeah, but I'm just thinking because I, I've actually... Uh, looked at a couple of times at JPEG images for, from the analysis point of view, and the artifacts are actually can or can be problematic. They can yes, be they, detected. Yes, they can, and that so, community currently does a substantial amount of image processing and computer vision on JPEG and JPEG 2000 compressed data. It is okay. the the standard in that community. There is okay. basically no instrument right now that will give you uncompressed data off. I mean, apart from probably some of the research focused ones, I know that, you know, Stefan, the, the Zeiss system can, Zeiss systems can give you uncompressed um, blocks for, for whole side imaging. But yeah, I agree but with you, no Jean Karim, fun. like yeah. most of the community that we normally deal with compress the data lossy. What are you talking about? That is, Everything that's in whole site imaging, for the most part, is compressed right out of the right out of the block. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, addition, or Sebastian, go ahead. I mean, on the addition regarding compression, which probably goes back to the spec. Uh, I mean, Chris had mentioned this beginning of at the moment, essentially. Compression is whatever NUM codec and NUM codec, I mean, specifies, right? So I, I had a new compression scheme to NUM codec. Essentially, I created Validzer with compression. So it brings us back, and there's also a big amount of work to some form of registry or some some infrastructure that form, like, I mean, has been existing in the TIFF ecosystem. What is the base set of compression that is supported? And what does it mean to add another compression, right? What are the rules? Where is that defined? I mean, obviously, we're working on that from the API pr perspective, adding some kind of extensible mechanism. There will also have to be a separate conversation about what's in, what's out, what's baseline, what's extended. Uh, hopefully, this will trigger this discussion as well. I mean, again, interplay between reference implementation and the core specification. Hopefully, that should be a fruitful discussion. Definitely. Stefan? Um, yeah, maybe, maybe just briefly. So um, yes, the, the, the slide scanners, um, it's very accepted, right? So that uh, you can compress the data um, and otherwise it's also probably for most of the um, users, customers, it's not uh, manageable to, to store that amount of data because um, it's easy to create a lot of data. Uh, the, the, the other part uh, is maybe um, you're not interested in all of the area, right? So maybe something clever can be done to just acquire things that are really matter. Um, but maybe you don't know beforehand. It um, depends very much on the, on the use case. Um, but uh, yeah, if you have a factor of 50 or 100 uh, compared to just two, um, yeah, that's, uh, that's, I think, natural that, um, uh, that for most of the use cases, um, uh, the data is mostly, mostly compressed and it's, uh, accepted. Definitely. With with RV three, I think there is a list of of codecs um, listed in the specification. Um, it's just looked it up. I think the the version of that piece of specification is is uh, almost two years old now. But um, I think that would be a good opportunity to to revise that list and uh, yeah, basically that will could serve as a base minimum of 
of compressors that any kind of SAR implementation should support. And uh, then, of course, uh, there can be can, can be extension codecs and stuff like that. Definitely. Definitely. And yes, you said there's plenty of, there's a lot of work in this space um, in terms of both lossless and loss-e compression schemes for images. Um, a lot of it being driven by consumer uh, product stuff. There's all sorts of implementations right there right now for compressing photos. Um, lots of effort around all that. Uh, and the same thing for um, in the commercial space as well. If you've been following any of the bioformats repositories recently, you will see at least a couple companies who have proprietary uh, compression schemes, which they would like to be able to include. That's going to continue, I think, before. Um, so, yeah, we need to, we definitely need to have an extensible um, mechanism for people to apply these things. And what Josh was saying about um, GDAL earlier, you know, the geophysical communities have to deal with this stuff um, every day, right? Uh, if you don't, if your compressor does not the compressor or decompressor does not adhere to the GDAL specifications for dealing with uh, compressed blocks, like you're not even entering that community um, at all, right? Um, so there is hopefully at least some precedent in other communities to try and help us with with this stuff, um, but yeah, it's it's definitely something we have to consider. For sure. So uh, to come back to, to I think uh, one of the last slides. So is this uh, the idea to to bring um, various components under one basically one project or what if eventually one repository? Um, Probably not one repository, but certainly what bring it under the Czar developers organization on GitHub, Shankarim, so that it's easy to find these projects and you know which ones to use together, right? Mm -hmm. And then we'll have to definitely put some effort into the documentation and user focused uh, direction. I think in that sense, the Czar Python community has done a great job of trying to, you know, bring everybody together there, even though FS spec and a bunch of these other um, projects are not in Czar developers, they are there kind of blessed and and suggested as ways to interact with the, with the data. So bring these repositories in, especially the ones that have languished without really any care or attention in the last multiple years. Um, hopefully give them a new lease on life, so to mm -hmm. speak. Um, give them a little bit of publicity. Hey, we're doing this. Please, you know, if you care about these things, please do pay attention. And we are paying attention um, to what's going on there. Uh, and hopefully that'll kind of kickstart a little bit of the the focus from the community on these things. And as Josh was saying, hopefully bring... <laughs> dozens of forks down to a little bit more focused effort, right? So, uh, but that would be um, language agnostic. Then that would be all kind, all projects that want to. At the moment, certainly, what we're going to be focusing on is JVM, so Java. Mm -hmm. um, I can't speak for the others, and I don't really want to. Uh, at this particular point in time, I'm certainly not talking about native code at this point. Um, but I think, you know, if we, if the community wanted to talk about MATLAB and R and, you know, a bunch of other things, um, Julia, et cetera, uh, I would encourage people who care about those communities to talk to the czar steering council and, you know, be very serious about what they're trying to do. 
Um, so when the implementation council was set up, Sean Kareem, so everyone was invited. So, you know, as being, you know, as part of being invited, you know, you are welcome to, to move your repository into the Czar developers organization and it will follow this governance process. Um, as I mentioned earlier, JavaScript was the only one that was kind of like, well, we're debating that we'll talk about it. Julia, for example, said very clearly, oh, we had this project, Julia IO. That's where we organize all of our IO projects. We want to run it on that side. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it, it really comes down to in each community, what's the best thing for, for finding the right developers to keep something active. You know, in Julia, I think the czar implementation is, is moving forward. So that's been very healthy for them. Um, I guess to some degree, you know, the, the czar developers organization is there for anyone who, who wants that mm -hmm. or needs a place to organize their community. But if there's a better place to do it, by all means. Yep. Excellent. I think the the last thing I would say on that, and I'll just from the point of view of um, those of us who put the presentation together, and I'll let Norman say his kind of two two pence, two cents, whatever on it is. At the moment, we can really only be focused on the things that the developer community that we have cares about and can develop and can dedicate resources to. So you care about XYZ compression scheme or whatever, get involved and work with the community in order to do the development work that's being done. There's a ton of opinions about out there about which compression we should use, which things we should support, which library should we should use, which object storage we should support, which et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. We've been pretty clear. These are the things that we can work on because they're the things that we care about. If you care about Azure, if you care about GCS, if you care about object storage protocol from whatever, get involved and start thinking about how to work on it. Um, there's just so much stuff to be done that actually, you know, we need hands to work on it. Um, and if we don't have those, it's not going to get done. So Norman, anything else you want to say on that? No, I definitely agree. I mean, we, we have the priorities that features that we want to support and that's the ones that we're going to prioritize and, um, yeah, and, but we're open for, for community work, right? So if anybody has any features that they need, then. Um, we're happy to discuss that. In particular, I think the first um, step that we're going to do is a design phase where we define like the interfaces and the layers that we want to build as abstractions. And uh, of, of course, going to also collect feedback on that level. But once we have that in place and also other new features will be much easier to implement. So. Yeah, I, I I think it's I think it's a worthwhile endeavor that we have here. Um, even though I mean we we have as our implementation, it kind of works, but I think looking into the future, it makes a lot of sense to pull resources together, to to just um, yeah make this maintainable over the long term. And I know Zara three is adding some more features, and I guess there will be a three point one and two and four and five and whatever. So and so I I really think that to to maintain this. Um, this is a worthwhile effort and it's, uh, new tools will come out of this that can be built on top of these libraries and will do fantastic things that helps the wider community. So, I mean, that was very interesting to me, all this discussion, but I, I mean, I guess my primary reason for coming here was exactly to learn that, but I, I guess what I wanted to actually get out of the meeting is again taking the my our perspective is what which libraries is the one that looks like the most stable or the most um the closest to a reference that could be used to as um to to wrap uh, in r so that basically we don't have to come every every few weeks or every six months and and redo the work because the thing is not stable or has just disappeared, is not maintained. So that's basically um, I, it. So I would say on that point specifically, Jean Karim, I could not put my hand on my heart now and tell you in good conscience to put your effort behind any of the implementations that exist today. Well, so 
at the moment, so my strategy at the moment is just to wait a bit because the, the, the one closest um, for us will be the net CDF because there is a net CDF R package. And it's just that the, the net CDF C implementation with R support is a bit too recent. So it's not trickled down to the usual package repositories, but um, it should become available in the next year or two, I guess, as it's back being backported probably. Um, and the other question really would be is the, if the X tensor is also an option because there is also an R package developed by the X tensor people. Um, I don't know, actually, I didn't look at how implemented it is. I just would not like to have this Python dependency, as I said several times, it's, a, it's often an, a problem. Um, but those would be kind of at the moment, the, the ways to go is because I've seen, I, I looked at the uh, GDAL one also, but it's also not, it doesn't seem as generic, I think, as Josh alluded to. It's more specific to what they want to do. So, I mean, I think, John Cream, that probably is the starting the starting point for another conversation. And, and happy to give you all the references, you know, all the email addresses. And mm. and we try to set up that call, you know, because it probably needs doing the same kind of table that that uh, Chris and Sebastian did for Java, but on that side. Mm -hmm. um, Answering, I think, you know, Chris isn't wrong, and I'll just let leave his comment standing, but that doesn't always help people decide, well, what should I do next? You know, should I just wait or should I not? Um, Xsensor Czar was funded by the first Chan Zuckerberg. So the development of that library was developed uh, funded by the first Chan Zuckerberg grant. And I think development in it has has slowed down significantly since then. That would be a conversation for those developers. You know, do you see ramping back up? What would it take? You know, are you interested? So, um, not something we can answer. Um, the rest of the the native implementations, like I said, I, I think it would be great to get them all together and have that conversation. But that's probably for another time. And I do think so. Obviously, Chris doesn't want to 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 promise, and that's that's a fair thing to do. But I do see what we're proposing here to have the potential for being a reference implementation, if that gets you what you need on not having a Python dependency. But obviously there's, it's going to be a while, right? So there's going to be yeah. a roadmap and, and we, there'll need to be a period of time where design is happening and, and, and hacking is happening. And eventually there will be something. That's, that's my two cents. Sorry, go ahead, Ken. Um, yeah, thank you very much for, uh, um, um, all the discussion. I mean, I just like uh, um, um, talking about uh, different implementations, whether it is possible with your list um, that George did or, or Chris did in the implementation, whether you can list out the, the overall architecture of za and what type of v, uh, of what type of function functionality that you need so if you, if somebody go into wanting to implement in another language whether you can kind of do the little bits do the little functions that you know somehow some of us can can have time to do those things and then eventually you get covered or else we will be waiting forever for somebody to to spend a lot of time getting it done. But given that, you know, um, Chris have already done quite a lot of work on the Java implementation and finding out what is needed, uh, what type of uh, uh, functionality like NumPy and things like that requirements, then wouldn't it be, would it be easier for, uh, for future or different languages implementations that you can have those things listed out that, you know, those languages do not have those functionalities, so somebody have to write different libraries for those in order to get it done. I think we're going to try to do the best job of that that we can, Ken, uh, okay. as part of this effort. Um, I don't know where the best place to do that is, <laughs> to be honest, <laughs> or where the best place for that information to live is. But would I, it be would it be back to the 
the Tsar, uh, what, what, possibly. What I mean, I think about again, the Tsar, the Tsar I think that that place. the Tsar Python community is going to have to wrestle with what it considers core, right? What it considers part of Tsar and what it considers part of Python, right? Um, yeah, it's going to have to wrestle with that. Um, and what it expects implementations to provide, right? Um, yeah. At the moment, certainly, like I said, you know, I, I have actually a great deal of respect for all of the work that has been done to to date. I don't think it, you know, it's been done in malice. I don't think that people who are in this space now who have these forks are doing them because they want to be bad actors in the in the ecosystem. They're just trying to get their work done. Right. Um, and, and there, because there isn't a place for multiple people to come and get their work done, everybody just needs to get their, their work done. Right. Um, you can say, okay, well, that's a selfish approach, but people got to do what they need to do in order to get their science done. Right. Um, there's a pretty small number of people who are funded specifically to work on infrastructure libraries like this in in science, and I'm sure Jason can go on a long rant about actually getting this type of work funded, <laughs> right, uh, in the academic community. And we're lucky that you know CZI and EOSC have funded some fairly fundamental libraries, right? There's no guarantee that's going to continue, right? Um, but there's a lot, you know, you look at the contributors to czar python right now and actually some of these other libraries they're not just academically funded individuals right mm. they're people from nvidia two people from anaconda people from you know all sorts of places we, we don't have that push necessarily here um and so yes going back to your original question ken i think we're going to try our best to do that try our best to raise some of these these points and be honest, right, with the community about what we are doing, what we're not doing, where we need help, and, you know, quite honestly, be very specific about, you know, from a developer perspective, unless, you know, we are not going to take a bunch of issues with a kind of shit list of stuff that we are supposed to do, right? Mm -hmm. We've got our goals, we've got our things, we're going to be quite specific about that. Um, and if you want to work on something, we're more than happy to support you. But you know, you've got to you've got to work on it, right? Yeah, I think my interpretation of what Ken was asking was actually the reverse: is that we come up with a shit list and and the community yeah. offers to help. So yeah, <laughs> yeah. So yeah, if you come up with the list of yeah shit lists uh, of things that. Those those little libraries we can do a little bits. You can, we may not be because we all have other things to do. But if we have little little tiny things, then maybe there is a chance of that being getting done. I was wondering. That was spectacular. <laughs> that was spectacular, Ken. I thought slow Ken was funny, but fast Ken was even funnier. <laughs> um, can, can the Crick um, network admins are watching you and timing um, latency. You know that was. You'll have to watch that on YouTube. That was perfect. <laughs> that was spectacular. Yeah, I mean, I would say Ken. Unfortunately, my experience now is making that list, and there's tons of those lists. Those lists are on a bunch of these repositories, uh, mm -hmm. etc. You know, I I don't think anybody at the moment now especially in the Java community, underestimates the amount of work that needs to be done. Um, getting the momentum, getting it, try to get it in one place, try to continue that momentum uh, at stuff, et cetera, is tricky. And that's not a developer problem, right? That's a, that's a tricky community fostering <laughs> that group, trying to get those people engaged, et cetera. It's, you know, it's not an easy, um, easy task at all. Right, we've got three minutes until our till the end. Last comment, John Karim. Uh, yeah, quickly. Also, because I also have to go. Um, so it's my understanding at the moment that OMEs are 
uh, maintains uh, and follows closely the ZAR specification. I'm just wondering if eventually um, there might not be grounds for actually having a, a slight divergence, basically, where um, the OME ZAR has some features of ZAR, but uh, the, the Python ZAR community goes in, in, in their own ways and that basically doesn't meet our our needs or that we need to focus on more pressing uh, features than uh, that the ZAR community, uh, the Python ZAR community uh, considers essential. It so is... I'm just wondering if as how far do we, or do you, because I'm not so much involved, um, maintain the, uh, basically the, the, the ZAR or ME ZAR parallelism. Um, and, and it is in the interest, and I will say this emphatically, it is in the interest of everybody in the biomedical imaging community to pay attention to what happens at the ZAR specification level. It is essential that this community pays attention to that and participates in that process. If you don't, we are going to get a singular community with a singular implementation, right? And yeah, we care about what's on disk. We care about how shareable it is. I mean, we spent umpteen hours uh, throughout this whole thing talking about metadata specifications and exchange. And yeah, we cannot have this become a new proprietary file format that mm -hmm. only one set of implementations can use, et cetera. It's not going to deliver on any of the things that we want it to deliver on. So no, I, I, I was, yes, absolutely. You, we will have to, as a community, pay close attention. And if we don't, yeah. those decisions will get made for us. Uh, I was thinking about some sort of middle ground where the uh, priorities would be uh, slightly different. So there, there would be some features that are mentioned in the specification, as you said, that are that are high priority maybe for the Python implementation, but they are less relevant for OME ZAR, for example. And that is a possibility, Jean Karim, but if we don't participate in that process, those mm -hmm. again, those decisions will be made for us. And I'll just add, as far as I know, nothing like that has been proposed or needed anywhere. Mm -hmm. And if it comes up, we should have a long and hard discussion about it. Yep. But, you know, in the spirit of, you know, politics and steering councils and all of that, right? This is not a spectator sport. This is not the things that we can do afterwards. Once those decisions are made and work is being done, they're just, those decisions are made and work is being done. Um, so, yeah, if we don't participate in that, um, you know, we will not be able to affect that process. So Josh is right. I think at the moment, there isn't any cases of that happening. Um, but the steering council all decides that that's what they want to do. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, we will be left holding the bag. So yeah, we have to participate. We have to go to these meetings. We have to look at the issues and, and structures that are there on the repositories, um, and make sure our voices are heard there. If they're not, um, like it's open source guys, right? Like, mm -hmm. uh, it's going to follow where the effort is and where the funding is and where the needs are, right? Um, and those may be in our interest or not in our interest. So yes, we need to participate in that process. Yeah. No, I, I'm, I'm not totally for get, get coming together, but I'm just thinking as was mentioned that uh, there might be a divergence of interest and then the middle ground would maybe be uh, the, to pick and choose, so to still be involved, but pick and choose the features uh, to prioritize, and they could be different between different implementations and different languages. Certainly. Yeah. All right. Okay, I have to go. Thanks a I lot. I think we'll Bye. close. Thanks, everyone. Thank you all. Thanks, guys. Take Just care. Thank you. Thank you.